Hey guys, CrimeCon is only a few days away. I'll be there in person on Podcast Row. I hope to see a lot of you there or even through their virtual access to the event. Head over to CrimeCon.com for details and to buy a pass. I hope some of you can join the fun and I'd love the opportunity to meet you. That's CrimeCon.com for details. Now, on with the show. The opinions expressed in this episode do not necessarily reflect those of the Murderish podcast. Sensitive topics are discussed. Listener discretion is advised. For over 45 years, the disappearance of controversial Teamsters leader Jimmy Hoffa has been one of America's most infamous and iconic unsolved mysteries. Finding his remains has become something of a modern-day treasure hunt, akin to the legend of the Holy Grail, shrouded in myth and mystique. The idea that Hoffa's remains are still out there, just waiting to be found, has fueled many people to devote their lives and their careers to the search, to finding the truth behind why and how he vanished in the summer of 1975. Many investigations have been conducted throughout the years, some of which are still ongoing today. These investigations make it abundantly clear that the Mafia was responsible for Hoffa's disappearance. But exactly who was involved and how it all went down and why it happened are all questions that still do not have definitive answers. And what exactly happened to Hoffa's body? That is the question that has captivated the world for decades. Dozens of theories have arisen over the years but none of them have panned out, which has only perpetuated the legend and kept the search alive. Whatever the truth is, Hoffa's family has given up hope that he will ever be found, because most of the people believed to be involved in his disappearance are dead, having taken the truth to their graves. And the few who are still alive are holding firm to the Mafia code of silence. This is Jamie, and you're listening to Murderish. Join me as I walk you through one of America's most iconic true crime mysteries, the disappearance of Jimmy Hoffa. The case takes us to Bloomfield Township in Oakland County, Michigan. As it was in 1975, Bloomfield Township is one of the most affluent neighborhoods of the suburbs of Detroit, widely considered to be one of the best places to live in Michigan. With a population just over 42,000, it's home to Oakland Hills Country Club, which has hosted several major professional golf events, and the Detroit Skating Club, where many notable world-class ice skaters have trained. Residents of Bloomfield Township can enjoy plenty of restaurants, coffee shops, and parks. And according to Niche.com, it's the number one best place to raise a family in Oakland County. But amid the peace and tranquility of this highly sought-after family town, some of the most dangerous mafia figures in history have lived and operated for generations. Jimmy Hoffa was officially reported missing on the morning of July 31, 1975, by his wife, Josephine. Hoffa failed to return home after a meeting the previous afternoon with two high-ranking mafia members, one of whom had become one of Hoffa's enemies. The men were scheduled to meet up in Bloomfield Township at a restaurant called Macus Red Fox. Josephine reported that her husband had been uncharacteristically nervous when he left for the meeting on July 30th at about 1.15 p.m. and that he called her around 2.15 p.m. to complain that he had been stood up. The last thing Hoffa ever said to his wife was that he would be home by about 4 to cook her a steak dinner on the grill. Josephine Hoffa hung up the phone and then her husband vanished without a trace. James Riddle Hoffa, or Jimmy, was born in Brazil, Indiana on February 14, 1913, to John Hoffa and Viola Riddle. 
Hoffa had one older sister, Janetta, and a younger brother and sister, Billy and Nancy. The family lived in an area of Brazil known as Stringtown, a neighborhood made up of miners and blue-collar workers. Hoffa's father, who had worked as a coal driller, died of lung disease when Hoffa was just seven years old. His mother worked very hard to provide for the family, doing housework in upper-class homes, taking in laundry, and working as a cook at a restaurant. In 1924, Hoffa's mother moved the family to Detroit, Michigan, hoping to find more opportunities. Eventually, she found a job in the auto industry, polishing radiator caps. When he was 12, Hoffa got a job bagging potatoes in a grocery store for 50 cents per week. When he was 14, he went to Western High School to enroll, but walked out prior to his name being called, and he never returned. For the next two years, Hoffa worked as a stock boy at a department store, dreaming of becoming part of management one day. But in 1929, Hoffa's whole world changed as the country's economy fell apart under the weight of the stock market crash. Business came to a screeching halt. People were laid off in droves, and by the mid-1930s, the country was seemingly starving to death. Drought set in and crops were turned to dust all across the country. Entire families found themselves homeless, living in the fields and parks, crowded into huts made of cardboard and tin. Detroit was hit especially hard, with half the city out of work. Food was so scarce that bread lines formed in the streets, and thousands of people would show up for a single job opening. When he was 16 years old, Hoffa was extremely lucky to find a job at a Kroger warehouse. For two years, he and his co-workers endured terrible working conditions for very little pay and no job security. Finally, unable to accept this treatment any longer, Hoffa organized his first strike. Nicknamed the Strawberry Boys, Hoffa and his fellow strikers refused to unload a delivery of fresh strawberries, demanding changes before they would go back to work. Kroger management, knowing the fruit would spoil in the heat if not dealt with properly, agreed to negotiate the following day if the boys would get back to work right away. True to their word, a contract was agreed upon within the next few days, greatly improving wages and benefits for workers. Hoffa's tenacity during the strike and negotiations caught the attention of the International Brotherhood of Teamsters Union, or IBT, from the Detroit office Local 299. The IBT was a large labor union composed mostly of truckers and warehouse workers, looking to expand its membership. Based on his reputation at Kroger, the Teamsters offered Hoffa a position as an organizer for Local 299, and he enthusiastically took it. He soon proved himself to be a great negotiator and earned the respect of Detroit's unionists. As an organizer, Hoffa was responsible for recruiting employees from several different companies to become Teamster members. He negotiated with management, organizing strikes when necessary. During the early years of union work, things were extremely violent. Anytime there was a strike, it was common practice for companies to send large groups of strike breakers to disrupt the picket lines. They were usually armed with clubs and ready to fight their way through the picket lines, inflicting as much damage as possible. In addition to strike breakers, companies sent armed goon squads for the sole purpose of intimidation, attempting to beat union workers into submission. The strikes would turn into vicious, bloody battles in the streets often involving gunfire, arson, and even bombings. Hoffa himself had his head cracked open multiple times, requiring stitches, and his brother was once shot in the stomach after someone mistook him for Hoffa. According to the book titled Hoffa, The Real Story by Jimmy Hoffa and Oscar Fraley, Hoffa said about the violence, it went that way on virtually a daily basis as the months passed into years. It was one long picket line after another, 
more fights with company goons and strike breakers, more bruises and more stitches in the head, and I was arrested so many times I lost count. Hoffa's union work was directly responsible for introducing him to his future wife. In May of 1936, Hoffa met Josephine Puziwak as they walked together in a picket line during a strike for the International Laundry Workers Union. They were married four short months later in Bowling Green, Ohio, by a justice of the peace. They would go on to have two children, a daughter, Barbara, and a son, James Jr. Although later in life he would claim to be of strict moral character, Hoffa did have an affair early on in his marriage with a woman named Sylvia Pagano. After their relationship was over, Pagano became involved with one of Detroit's most notorious mobsters, Frankie Three Fingers Coppola, the Detroit boss for Lucky Luciano's heroin ring. It was through Pagano that Hoffa was introduced to members of the Detroit underworld like Frankie, as well as other organized crime families. These relationships would eventually help to propel Hoffa to the national presidency of the Teamsters and ultimately to his mysterious death. Okay, for all of you men who don't want to look like a basic dude wearing a standard wedding band, you know, the one every other guy is wearing, check out Manly Bands. Manly Bands makes really cool and unique wedding bands made out of interesting materials like wood, antler, steel, dinosaur bone, and even meteorites. Manly Bands even has a curated collection for whiskey lovers, like my husband. Their Jack Daniels Whiskey Barrel Collection has wedding bands made out of wood from actual whiskey barrels. It's really easy to order and make sure you get the right sized ring the first time around. Just order the Manly Ring Sizer from Manly Bands to make sure your man's ring is a perfect fit. Then have fun choosing a wedding band from the numerous styles and materials Manly Bands has to offer. Manly Bands are fully customizable from style, material, inlay, sleeve, and finish. Plus, you'll get free shipping worldwide and a 30-day exchange policy and a free warranty. Your man is really going to dig his Manly Band. To order his Manly Band and get 21% off, plus a free silicone ring, go to manlybands.com slash murderish. That's manlybands.com slash murderish for 21% off. Manly Bands, the best damn rings, period. Planning a wedding is so stressful. Zola makes wedding planning easier and less stressful by creating everything couples need all in one place. Wedding vendors, save the dates and invitations, free websites, registry, and more. Zola even pre-screens vendors for you, so you don't waste time with a photographer, venue manager, or others who aren't the right fit. With Zola, you can order gorgeous save the dates and invitations, and there are tons of designs to choose from. No worries if you change the date, because Zola sends free change the dates with your order. You can even sample their paper before you purchase. Zola's benefits don't stop there. You can even create a free wedding website to share photos, event details, and updates with all of your guests. The website takes minutes to create. Zola also provides a registry on your website so guests can easily buy the right gifts for you. For added help with wedding planning, Zola offers assistance from a wedding advisor, an actual living, breathing person who understands how to put a wedding together. Go to Zola.com slash murderish today and use promo code SAVE50, that's SAVE50, to get 50% off your save the dates. You can also get free personalized paper samples before you purchase. That's Zola.com slash murderish, promo code SAVE50. From early on, the mob was often used by companies to act as muscle against the union's efforts. With his newfound underworld associations, Hoffa was able to use his connections with these gangsters to broker a kind of truce where the mob remained neutral when it came to the Teamsters. With the mob out of the fight, 
Hoffa and his old pals from the Strawberry Boys could handle any other muscle that management could muster. In return for their cooperation, Hoffa allowed the mob to gain a foothold into the Detroit trucking industry, their companies receiving breaks from the unions. Hoffa continued to receive promotions with the local Teamsters based on his ability to negotiate and rally membership. In 1937, at only 23 years old, Hoffa was put in charge of organizing long-haul truckers in the Midwest states, helping to recruit enough members to work out a contract with the companies involved. The contract was a huge victory for the Teamsters, and his work on the project helped Hoffa take over the position of chairman of the Michigan Conference of Teamsters in 1941. That same year, Hoffa hired Roland McMaster as one of his organizers and enforcers. McMaster, known to be extremely violent and willing to get his hands dirty, formed a goon squad of his own to deal with strikebreakers and rival unions throughout the 1940s. Decades later, his alliances shifted, and McMaster was widely suspected of helping to dispose of Hoffa's body. In 1941, a battle for turf erupted with a rival union, Congress of Industrial Organizations, or CIO. Their men proved to be too tough for McMaster's goon squad to handle. In a move that would forever change the direction of his life, Hoffa reached out to his mafia friends for help with the CIO issue. The Detroit mafia gave Hoffa the necessary muscle to defeat his rivals and protect Teamster turf. Because of their success and the positive response from union members at the victory, Hoffa continued to use his underworld friends on a regular basis moving forward. According to Dan Moldea, investigative journalist, author, and the world's foremost expert on all things Hoffa, the victory was a tragedy for the American labor movement. The CIO's defeat, brought about by Hoffa's ringers, became the major factor in his rapid plunge from union reformer to labor racketeer. His pact with the underworld, no matter how tenuous at the time, took him out of the running as a potentially great leader of the Teamsters' rank and file. This according to Dan Moldea's book titled Hoffa Wars, The Rise and Fall of Jimmy Hoffa. Before long, some of the Mafia's most notorious members were voted into Teamsters' local presidencies and beyond. By 1946, Hoffa was named the president of Local 299, becoming a major player and reputed tough guy within the union, his influence and reputation reaching well past Detroit. Hoffa had become quite famous. His face was more recognizable than most movie stars of the time. In the early 1950s, members of the Detroit Mafia began to find their way into legitimate businesses with Hoffa's help. Given union protection, the Mafia gained monopolies in the various industries through threats and intimidation. By the mid-1950s, Hoffa and his union partners, including the Mafia, had either destroyed or purchased their competition. In 1952, Hoffa became the national vice president of the IBT. During that time, he began making questionable personal purchases and investments with member pension funds or directly from union treasuries, making himself a very rich man. In 1955, Hoffa helped set up the Central States Pension Fund with Alan Dorfman, a financier and insurance agency owner with connections to the Chicago Mafia. The Mobs Bank, as the pension fund came to be known, was used to furnish loans to Mafia members in order to finance the building and purchase of many Las Vegas casinos beginning in 1958. Casinos such as the Dunes, the Fremont, the Stardust, Circus Circus, the Tropicana, the Aladdin, and Caesar's Palace were all financed with Teamsters' pensions without their knowledge. However, though such business investments were not sanctioned by union members, they were responsible for Teamster pensions being much higher than those of other labor unions. 
In 1957, Hoffa was elected national president of the IBT. With its membership over two million strong, Hoffa was now the boss of his own family, nearly indistinguishable from his mafia counterparts. In 1957, the U.S. Senate formed a committee in order to investigate labor union corruption. Known as the McClellan Committee, they began investigating the IBT's practices. The committee included Senator John F. Kennedy and his younger brother, Robert Bobby Kennedy, as chief counsel. Their goal was to publicly investigate the growing power of the Teamsters and their relationship with organized crime in order to attack union credibility. Hoffa was relentlessly hunted by Bobby Kennedy, the two famously arguing with each other during the committee hearings on live national television multiple times. It was very clear that they despised each other. As a result of the hearings, Hoffa was indicted on bribery charges in 1957. In October of that same year, Hoffa was elected president of the IBT, even though he was under indictment at the time. And though he was caught on FBI surveillance footage clearly exchanging money for committee documents, Hoffa was acquitted of the charges. However, that arrest triggered additional investigations and more indictments for perjury and wiretapping in the following weeks. But, as seemed to happen whenever he was indicted, Hoffa was acquitted on all charges, much to Kennedy's disbelief. The McClellan Committee conducted a second set of hearings in September of 1957, focusing specifically on the Detroit Teamsters. Ultimately, Hoffa was charged with 34 improper activities, ranging from labor racketeering to working with organized crime. The committee's report made it clear that they found Hoffa to be a dangerous influence in American labor and that he had too much power for one man. Despite these charges, Hoffa was re-elected as IBT national president in 1961 and by 1964 had succeeded in negotiating the first ever National Master Freight Agreement covering all over the road and local truck drivers in North America. It was Hoffa's crowning achievement. Shortly thereafter, Hoffa was indicted for jury tampering in Tennessee for bribing a grand jury member during a 1962 conspiracy trial in Nashville. He was convicted on March 4, 1964, and sentenced to eight years in prison. On July 26, 1964, Hoffa was also convicted of conspiracy and mail and wire fraud for improper use of the Teamsters Pension Fund in a second trial that took place in Chicago. He was sentenced to another five years in prison to be served consecutively. Hoffa was re-elected for a third term and continued to operate as Teamsters president while he spent the next three years out on bail, appealing his convictions all the way up to the U.S. Supreme Court. His fight, however, was unsuccessful, as none of his convictions were overturned. Hoffa entered the Lewisburg Federal Penitentiary in Pennsylvania on March 7, 1967. Coincidentally, Local 560 president and New Jersey Mafia captain, Anthony Tony Pro Provenzano, one of Hoffa's allies, was in prison there at the same time. The two got into a huge fist fight over an unknown issue, the disagreement so severe that it completely severed their relationship. Still serving as IBT president while incarcerated, Hoffa received $100,000 annually and he had no intention of relinquishing his lucrative position. He selected Frank Fitzsimmons, a Hoffa loyalist and longtime member of Local 299, to be his acting president. Fitzsimmons was expected to maintain the status quo, acting on Hoffa's orders, but that did not last long. Fitzsimmons began making his own decisions, reorganizing the union, and giving even more power to the mafia. Hoffa, dejected and desperately wanting out of prison, resigned as national president in 1971, 
in the hopes of earning an early parole. Fitzsimmons was promptly sworn in as new IBT president. On December 23, 1971, Hoffa was released from prison after serving less than five years of his 13-year sentence. President Richard Nixon commuted his sentence, including the caveat that Hoffa was unable to engage in management of any labor organization until 1980, a provision worked into the commutation by none other than Frank Fitzsimmons. Believing the restrictions to be illegal, Hoffa immediately filed lawsuits, spending several years embroiled in court proceedings. Confident that the restrictions would be lifted, he began working to take back control of the Teamsters. By this time, Hoffa had lost much of the support he once had from union members, so he called on his associates in the mafia to help support his bid to regain the presidency. He was met with staunch opposition and threats to his life. The mafia had enjoyed free reign with Fitzsimmons, finding that he could be manipulated in ways that Hoffa could not, and they made their choice. Fitzsimmons was their man, and they would do anything to keep Hoffa from returning. Hoffa went on a full-blown media assault against his former associates, ignoring many warnings for him to give up or else. Unfortunately for Hoffa, a self-described bulldog, relentless and unwavering, he refused to quit. Not long after, the men he once called friends and associates would be brought before a federal grand jury accused of being involved in his shocking disappearance, and Hoffa would never be heard from again. The initial investigation into Hoffa's disappearance was handled by local Bloomfield Township authorities, who responded after Hoffa's wife, Josephine, reported him missing on the morning of July 31, 1975. By 7 o'clock that evening, the FBI had been called in to assist, along with the Michigan State Police. On August 5th, the FBI assumed full command of the investigation and began extensive interviews surrounding the case, presuming that Hoffa was already dead. The FBI interviewed Hoffa's friends and family and delved into the Teamsters and his mafia associates. What they were able to piece together was a complicated, well-thought-out plot to kill Hoffa, including several moving parts, misdirection, and secrecy at a level not seen before. On July 30, 1975, at about 1 p.m., Hoffa left his home in Orion Township en route to Marcus Red Fox Restaurant in Bloomfield Township for a sit-down meeting with Tony Jack alone known as Tony Jack, street boss of the Detroit Mafia, and Anthony Provenzano, captain of the New Jersey faction of the New York Genovese crime family. Hoffa was possibly expecting Lenny Schultz to be at the meeting as well. Having been a longtime labor consultant, mafia associate, and go-between for Hoffa and Tony Jack alone. The men were supposedly meeting to hash out a disagreement between Hoffa and Provenzano, who were once allies but had become bitter enemies in the 1960s. Tony Jack alone was to act as a mediator because he knew both Hoffa and Provenzano well, having married into the Provenzano family. It's unknown exactly what the disagreement was about. But no matter the case, Hoffa knew that if he wanted to regain the presidency, he needed Provenzano's support and Teamster votes. The FBI also theorized that Provenzano could have been a lure to get Hoffa out into the open for another reason. Hoffa had made a deal with the government to get his restrictions on union management lifted, becoming an FBI informant as he relentlessly pursued the Teamster presidency. Just before his disappearance, Hoffa was scheduled to testify in front of the U.S. Senate during the Church Committee hearings on government intelligence activities. It was believed that he was going to testify as to his knowledge of and involvement in the assassination of President Kennedy. 
the FBI had already determined that he had the means, motive, and opportunity to carry out the assassination, so it was clear that Hoffa had information to give. The two mafia bosses who were also allegedly involved in the assassination and set to testify prior to Hoffa were executed before speaking to the committee. The FBI believed that the mafia needed to take out Hoffa before he divulged too much information. It was the organization's belief that a hit on Hoffa was authorized at the highest levels of La Costa Nostra, most likely by Russell Buffalino, acting boss of the Genovese crime family, who then gave the contract to Provenzano. According to interviews with Josephine Hoffa, Hoffa Jr., and Hoffa's best friend, Louis the Pope Linto, Hoffa had been approached several times in the weeks leading up to his disappearance by Tony Jackalone and his brother Vito Billy Jack Jackalone, also a captain in the Detroit Mafia. The Jackalone brothers were well known to Hoffa, as they were his Mafia contacts for many years. They had been trying to get Hoffa to sit down with Provenzano and work out their differences, but Hoffa continually refused to meet. There was no indication as to why he decided to go ahead with the meeting that fateful July afternoon. Hoffa's date book showed a note written in his handwriting that indicated a meeting on July 30th with Tony G. at the Red Fox at 2 p.m. Hoffa drove to the Red Fox in his green 1974 Pontiac Grandville, stopping first at Linto's office to ask him to accompany him to the meeting. However, Linto had left early for lunch and wasn't there. Hoffa left a message with Linto's secretary, letting him know that he was on his way to meet with Tony Jackalone, Provenzano, and Schultz at the Red Fox. Hoffa arrived at the Maccas Red Fox and was observed by several people in the parking lot, some of whom stopped to have conversations with him and shake his hand. At about 2.30 p.m., no one had shown up to the meeting and a visibly frustrated Hoffa left the Red Fox and walked to a payphone in the shopping center directly behind the restaurant. He called Linto first, and then Josephine, telling them that Tony G stood him up and that he was leaving the restaurant. This was the last time Hoffa ever spoke to anyone. He then walked back to his car in the Red Fox parking lot, where witnesses observed a maroon sedan with three unknown males inside, pull up to him at about 2.45 p.m. Hoffa appeared to willingly get inside the vehicle, and it drove off, nearly hitting a truck as it exited the parking lot. The driver of that truck later told investigators that he saw Hoffa in the back seat, next to an unknown male. This was the last time Hoffa was ever seen. It is believed that Hoffa was murdered shortly thereafter at a location close by and then his body was disposed of. On August 19, 1975, federal agents seized a vehicle they believed to be the maroon sedan Hoffa entered before he vanished. The vehicle, owned by Tony Jackalone's son, Joseph Joey Jack Jackalone, was a brand new maroon 1975 Mercury Marquis. Police dogs found Hoffa's scent in the back seat and the trunk of the vehicle. This indicated that Hoffa had been in the vehicle, most likely in the back seat, while he was alive, and then in the trunk as his dead body was transported. A Remington Wingmaster 12 gauge pump shotgun was located in a black case inside the trunk, along with a case of 12 gauge shotgun shells. Numerous 38 and 22 caliber bullets were found inside the glove compartment, and a black leather pistol holder was found under the driver's seat. On September 19th, an FBI laboratory report confirmed that a single 3-inch brown head hair was located on the rear seat backrest of the vehicle, and it had similar characteristics to hairs taken from Hoffa's personal hairbrush. The vehicle was put into an FBI evidence storage facility where it remains to this day. On the morning of Hoffa's disappearance, the vehicle had been driven by Hoffa's surrogate son, Chucky O'Brien, 
whose mother was Hoffa's one-time mistress, Sylvia Pagano. O'Brien spent much of his life living with the Hoffas and at one time was very close to Jimmy Hoffa. At the time of Hoffa's disappearance, however, the two were not speaking. O'Brien didn't have a car of his own, so he borrowed Joey Jackalones that morning in order to deliver a 40-pound freshwater salmon to Teamster Union official Bobby Holmes. The fish leaked blood onto the rear seat of the car, so after dropping off the fish at the Holmes residence, O'Brien took the vehicle to a car wash to clean the interior. At about 2.15 p.m., O'Brien returned the freshly washed car to the Jackalone Brothers headquarters located at the Southfield Athletic Club in Southfield, Michigan. The club, owned by Lenny Schultz, was only five miles south of the Red Fox. I wear a gold necklace just about every day, but I'm picky about the quality and the way it looks and feels. I recently started wearing pieces from Ana Luisa and I'm so happy with them. I have three Ana Luisa necklaces and I've worn all of them several times to date nights, a sporting event, and out running errands. And I have to say, they're so comfortable and stylish. I've even layered two of the necklaces together for an elevated look. My Ana Luisa necklaces pair so well with a t-shirt and jeans or a cocktail dress for a night out. I was so excited to partner with Ana Luisa on Murderish because the exceptional quality of their pieces and their sustainable mission with regard to carbon emissions. 100% of carbon emissions related to Ana Luisa's product's life cycle are offset, which shows they truly care about our planet. Ana Luisa backs up their products with a 365-day warranty, so you know quality is top of mind. Jewelry starts at just $39, and Murderish listeners can get 10% off all products by going to analuisa.com slash murderish. That's A-N-A-L-U-I-S-A dot com slash murderish for 10% off. I highly recommend this company and their timeless jewelry. Treat yourself or someone you love. Go to analuisa.com slash murderish for 10% off. That's A-N-A-L-U-I-S-A dot com slash murderish for 10% off. 2020 was a rough year for many of us. The pandemic and politics weighed heavy on everyone. If you're still feeling the negative mental effects of last year, therapy can be a great tool to turn the corner and leave the past behind. Talkspace allows you to speak with a licensed therapist from the comfort of your own home. Through the Talkspace platform, you can send and receive unlimited messages with your therapist 24-7. And don't worry about privacy because Talkspace uses the most up-to-date encryption technology to store your information and comply with HIPAA regulations. Not only do you not have to leave your house to get therapy, Talkspace costs so much less than in-person therapy. Talkspace therapists are available to speak with you about depression, anxiety, substance abuse, trauma, anger management, relationship issues, food and eating, and more. As a listener of this podcast, you'll get $100 off your first month with Talkspace. To match with a licensed therapist today, go to Talkspace.com. Make sure to use the code MURDERISH to get $100 off your first month and show your support for the show. That's MurderishandTalkspace.com. Tony Jackalone was not known to be very social or overly talkative to anyone, let alone perfect strangers. However, he became very friendly on the day Hoffa disappeared. He made himself very visible, walking around the Southfield Athletic Club with Schultz all day, asking people for the time, shaking hands, and asking people how they were doing. Tony told the FBI that he did not have any kind of meeting scheduled with Hoffa that day, but the FBI had already confirmed that such a meeting had been set into motion. Tony clearly had no intention of showing up to the meeting he initiated. It was apparent to the FBI that Tony and Schultz had been establishing an alibi for themselves by making sure people saw them at the club during the time Hoffa disappeared. 
and even more telling for the FBI, was the fact that Tony met with Giacomo Blackjack Toco, acting boss of the Detroit Mafia, at the Southfield Athletic Club the day after Hoffa disappeared. This signaled something major had taken place as the two almost never met face-to-face. Provenzano had very little to say during his interview with FBI investigators. He told them that he was in New Jersey on July 30th, playing cards in Union City, and didn't know anything about Hoffa's disappearance. On the morning that Hoffa vanished, Vito Jackalone was under surveillance by federal and state agencies. He was able to lose his tail at about 10.30 a.m., and was not seen again by the surveillance team until about 5.30 p.m. He did not have an alibi when questioned. It is believed that Vito took possession of the freshly washed Mercury belonging to his nephew, then drove it with two unknown passengers to the Red Fox. He had ample time to make this happen, while surveillance teams had no idea where he was. It is believed that Hoffa must have felt comfortable with whoever was in the vehicle that picked him up, or he would have never gotten inside. Vito was Hoffa's longtime trusted friend, and he would have no problem getting inside the car with him. It was initially thought that Chucky O'Brien picked up Hoffa that day, however. The two were not on good terms, and Hoffa would have never gotten into the car with him. Also, The Mafia considered O'Brien to be something of a buffoon and never would have trusted him with something so sensitive. The FBI eventually came to believe that O'Brien was nothing more than a pawn used by the Mafia for misdirection. On August 6, 1975, Roland McMaster was interviewed by the FBI. The longtime Teamster legbreaker and former ally to Hoffa was immediately suspected when Hoffa went missing. The FBI knew that McMaster always desired to control Local 299, something Hoffa was adamantly against, and he had a long history of violence associated with the Detroit office. In addition, just days after Hoffa disappeared, investigative journalist Dan Muldea received information from a source that McMaster was involved in the disposal of Hoffa's body. When interviewed, McMaster claimed that he had been at his farm, the Hidden Dreams Ranch, in Wixom, Michigan, all day on July 30th, and knew nothing about Hoffa's disappearance. A federal grand jury was convened in Detroit on September 2, 1975. More than 50 witnesses were called, including Provenzano, Tony Jackalone, Vito Jackalone, Roland McMaster, Chucky O'Brien, and Frank Sheeran, an associate of Russell Buffalino. Most of the men refused to answer questions, taking the fifth against self-incrimination. The grand jury lasted through December, but it did not result in any charges or indictments being filed. On November 5, 1975, an FBI informant, Ralph Picardo, a former driver for Provenzano, who was serving time in a New Jersey prison, for second-degree murder, told FBI officials that he had information about Hoffa. Picardo was already a vetted informant, having previously provided accurate information regarding another case. According to Picardo, Stephen Andretta visited him in prison a few days after Hoffa disappeared and admitted that he and his brother, Thomas Andretta, as well as two other brothers, Salvatore Sally Bugs and Gabriel Gabe Bugs Bergulio were involved in Hoffa's murder. All four men were soldiers in the Genovese crime family and Provenzano's most trusted associates. They were also New Jersey Teamsters associated with Local 560. Picardo claimed that Stephen Andretta told him Hoffa had been murdered in Detroit, stuffed into a 55 gallon drum, and then shipped to New Jersey by Gateway Transportation Company. Interestingly, Gateway Transportation was already on the FBI's radar, as Roland McMaster was part owner of the company, along with his brother-in-law, Stanton Barr. McMaster had already pleaded the fifth during the federal grand jury hearings regarding this connection to Hoffa. According to Picardo, 
Stephen Andretta claimed that he was not present in Detroit for the murders, but that he stayed in New Jersey to provide an alibi for Provenzano. This was verified when Provenzano claimed he was playing cards with Stephen Andretta during an August 4th interview with the FBI. Picardo was not told the identity of Hoffa's killer, but he told the FBI he knew of a failed hit on Hoffa, ordered by Provenzano in late 1973 or early 1974, and that it was specifically contracted to Sally Bugs. Picardo also told the FBI that though he was not told the location of Hoffa's remains, he knew from personal experience that after Provenzano had someone whacked, their bodies usually wound up in a 55-gallon oil drum and buried in a New Jersey landfill called Brothers Moscato Dump, a.k.a. the PJP Landfill. The dump was co-owned by Philip Brother Moscato, a soldier in the Genovese crime family who worked under Provenzano, and by Paul Coppola, who was not a made man but did business with the mob. The Andrettas and Bergulios appeared during the federal grand jury, all four taking the fifth against self-incrimination. In late 1975, the FBI conducted a search warrant at the PJP landfill based on Picardo's information, but without knowledge on a specific location for Hoffa's remains, the search was aborted. Taking into consideration all of the interviews conducted, the federal grand jury findings and Picardo's information, the FBI formed a theory on what exactly happened to Hoffa on the day he vanished. They believed that Buffalino authorized the hit on Hoffa, giving the contract to Provenzano, who then tasked Sally Bugs with carrying out the hit. Vito Jackalone was enlisted to be the driver of the vehicle that scooped up Hoffa from the Red Fox, along with two passengers who were most likely some combination of Thomas Andretta, Gabe Bugs, and Frank Sheeran. Sheeran had been a longtime teamster and a good friend of Hoffa's, but also happened to be an associate of Buffalino. Hoffa was then driven to an unknown location close by and killed by Sally Bugs. Hoffa's body was then transported to an unknown location in the trunk of Joseph Jackalone's Mercury Marquis, where his body was disposed of. Thomas Andretta, Gabe Bugs, and Sheeran may have had a part in the cleanup of the murder scene. The FBI believed that it was most probable that Hoffa's body was taken to Central Sanitation, a Detroit mafia-owned trash company, where he was placed in an incinerator and burned to ashes. Curiously, Central Sanitation burned to the ground a few months after Hoffa disappeared, and no evidence of his having been there was ever found. Today, many within the FBI strongly believe that it was not Buffalino who ordered the hit on Hoffa, but Detroit godfather Joseph Zirilli, who gave the contract to acting boss Blackjack Toko and his street boss Tony Jackalone. One of their soldiers, Anthony Tony Pal Palazzolo, was given the task of killing Hoffa. This theory is based on recordings taken in the 1990s where Palazzolo bragged about killing Hoffa on an FBI wire. In addition, in 2012, an informant told the FBI that Palazzolo beat and strangled Hoffa to death. In 2004, Frank Sheeran's story was memorialized in a book called I Heard You Paint Houses. In the book, which became the basis for the award-winning film The Irishman, starring Robert De Niro, Sheeran claimed to have killed Hoffa after Chucky O'Brien drove him to a house on Beaverland Street in Detroit, about 20 minutes from the Red Fox. That same year, in response to his confession, the floorboards of that house were pulled up and traces of blood were found. However, they were not a DNA match for Hoffa. Sheeran's story, as well as the portrayal in The Irishman, has been proven to be completely false a dying man's last-ditch effort to earn a book deal and some money for his family. The claims in the book contradicted previous statements he gave during interviews throughout the years, 
and didn't match up with what was known about the day Hoffa disappeared. Also, several mafia figures have said that Sheeran had no part in Hoffa's actual murder. Around 2008, Detroit mafia expert, author, and filmmaker Scott Bernstein began supporting a theory about where Hoffa was murdered. Bernstein believed, based on his extensive knowledge of the Detroit Mafia and information from his sources, that Hoffa was most likely killed at the home of Detroit Mafia soldier Carlo Licata. The house, known as the House on the Hill, was a five-minute drive from the Red Fox and a place Hoffa had met the Jackalone brothers several times before. Hoffa would not have found it unusual to be driven to Licata's home. The house was also perfectly placed, located off the road, away from prying eyes. Lakata, who also happened to be the brother-in-law of Blackjack Toko, died under suspicious circumstances at the house on the six-year anniversary of Hoffa's disappearance, shot twice in the chest, most likely the victim of a mafia hit from his own family. In 2020, an informant came forward with information that Hoffa had been murdered at the home of Lenny Schultz, one of the men Hoffa was set to meet on the afternoon he vanished, and the owner of the Southfield Athletic Club. The house was a five-minute drive from the Red Fox and, per grand jury testimony, had been previously used as a kill spot for the mafia. The informant, a former driver for Schultz, said that Schultz confessed to him in the 1990s that Hoffa was murdered in his kitchen, that Hoffa had been strangled and his body had been given to Roland McMaster for disposal. Incidentally, Schultz's home was just a short drive up the road from McMaster's farm, the Hidden Dreams Ranch. Though many people believe that Hoffa's body was incinerated or otherwise destroyed shortly after he was murdered, there are others who firmly believe that Hoffa's body was buried. One of these people is investigative journalist and Hoffa expert, Dan Moldea. Moldea, who has interviewed nearly every person who was believed to be involved in Hoffa's murder, was able to conduct a series of interviews with Philip Brother Moscato between 2007 and 2014. Moscato, co-owner of the PJP Landfill, told Moldea that Picardo basically had it right referring to the FBI informant from 1975. He said that Vito Jackalone was the driver of the car that picked up Hoffa at the Red Fox. Sally Bugs killed Hoffa, and then Hoffa's body was indeed buried in his 87-acre New Jersey dump. The dump, filled with toxic waste, became an EPA Superfund cleanup location during the late 1970s and 1980s, during which time tons of waste was removed and the area was cleaned. Many people wonder whether Hoffa's remains could still be there after such an extensive cleanup. Moscato refused to give Moldea the whole story of Hoffa's murder, and he died on February 16, 2014. A few months after his death, Moldea was introduced to his son, Philip Moscato Jr., Moldea interviewed Moscato Jr. from 2014 to 2019, during which time he explained that his father had given him information about Hoffa's murder and the location of his body just days before he died. Moscato Jr. said unequivocally that Sally Bugs killed Hoffa, but he refused to give the rest of the story. Moscato Jr. was apparently looking for a deal with the production company before revealing everything. Moldea was able to glean that after Ralph Picardo informed the FBI about where Hoffa was taken back in 1975, Moscato Sr. was ordered to move Hoffa's body from the PJP landfill and relocate it, with the help of Vinnie Ravo, who was a New Jersey mobster and business owner. But Moscato Jr. would not reveal where the body was moved to. Moldea did some investigative work and found a location that fit with what little information Moscato Jr. gave about the burial spot. All signs pointed towards the parking lot of a golf club in Carlstadt, New Jersey, bordering the Hackensack River and once owned by an attorney who represented both Bravo and Moscato Sr. 
Moscato Jr. refused to verify if this was the correct location without getting some kind of compensation first. Moldea and Fox News investigative reporter Eric Sean, who had been investigating the Hoffa mystery for nearly two decades, began to work together to try to get the full story from Moscato Jr., an endeavor that is still ongoing today. To this date, he has refused to take a polygraph test or sign an affidavit regarding the facts he claims to know, two things Moldea pushes for when working with sources. Though Moscato Jr. would not fully cooperate with these requests, another source emerged who had no problem complying. Are you guilty of doom scrolling on your phone for more time than you'd like to admit? I definitely am, but recently, I replaced a lot of my doom scrolling with playing Best Fiends, a really fun and challenging mobile puzzle game. After I play Best Fiends, my brain feels like it just swam a few laps in the pool because it's so challenging. It's the opposite of that dreadful mush brain feeling that you get after aimlessly staring at your social media accounts. You've seen those games where all you do is smash candy. Well, I can tell you that Best Fiends is not that. It's way more fun. I've become a little obsessed. Advancing through game levels is so satisfying and I never get bored because Best Fiends has thousands of fun puzzle games and adorable characters you can collect as you go. The game is updated all the time, so you're always going to have something new to look at and explore. Other puzzle games don't even come close to what Best Fiends offers. Seriously, you have to check it out. I triple dog dare you to put it down quickly after you try it because you won't be able to. Download the five-star rated puzzle game Best Fiends free today on the Apple App Store or Google Play. That's friends without the R, Best Fiends. Are you looking for a new podcast to binge? Let me tell you about Murder in Alliance. On April Fool's Day, 1999, 26-year-old Yvonne Lane was found nearly decapitated in her Ohio home while her kids slept. Nearly everyone who knew Yvonne had a motive to kill her. But her ex-boyfriend and father of one of her children, David Thorne, was the one sentenced to life without parole for her murder. But evidence points to his innocence. Now, 22 years later, investigative journalist Maggie Freeling is reinvestigating the case alongside Jason Baldwin, himself wrongfully convicted as a member of the West Memphis Three and his organization Proclaim Justice. Maggie and the team of investigators are on the ground in Alliance, Ohio, the town where the murder happened, where they are uncovering new suspects, new evidence, police corruption, and a potential cover-up. And they are reporting their investigation in real time. Find Murder in Alliance wherever you get your podcasts. In September of 2019, Moldea was contacted by Frank Coppola, son of the late Paul Coppola, who co-owned PJP Landfill with Philip Moscato Sr. Frank, who had been a lieutenant for New Jersey gangster Vinny Ravo, told Moldea that Hoffa was indeed buried at the PJP Landfill. In fact, Frank claimed to know the exact location of Hoffa's body and deny that Hoffa was ever moved from the dump, as Moscato Jr. claimed. Over the course of six phone interviews, Frank provided specific details about Hoffa's murder based on his own memories as well as statements from his father. When Moldea met Frank in person on September 28th, he provided a sworn affidavit about what he knew and agreed to take a polygraph test. He wanted to fully cooperate with law enforcement in order to keep a promise to his dying father, who passed in 2008. Paul Coppola gave his son details about Hoffa's remains and asked Frank to help Hoffa return home to his family, according to Dan Moldea's Confessions of a Guerrilla Writer, Adventures in the Jungles of Crime, Politics, and Journalism. Frank's sworn statement included the following details. An unknown person or persons 
ordered Moscato Sr. and Frank Coppola to bury Hoffa's body. Frank had been present when this order was given in 1975 at the PJP landfill, where he worked part-time when he was 17. Moscato Sr. asked Paul to take care of burying Hoffa and physically pointed to where he wanted him buried within the landfill. This angered Paul because the dump was always under police surveillance and pointing to a spot could have given away the location. Once Moscato left the landfill, Paul decided to dig a second hole away from where Moscato Sr. had pointed and placed Hoffa in that location. Paul never told anyone about this second location. Unknown people brought Hoffa's dead body to the PJP landfill in an unknown container. In order to get Hoffa's body to fit into a 55-gallon steel drum from PJP, they had to place him headfirst into the drum, and then the container was sealed. After those people left the landfill, Paul placed the steel drum with Hoffa's body inside at the bottom of a large hole he dug, about 8 to 15 feet deep. He placed between 15 to 30 chemical drums in the hole, along with chunks of brick and dirt to conceal Hoffa's drum. He then covered the hole with a bulldozer, making the grave his secret. Frank said he would reveal the exact location of the hole to law enforcement, along with two additional and provable details about the location. And finally, Frank said his father put something detectable just under the surface of the gravesite, which he was willing to reveal to authorities. On the morning of September 29, 2019, Moldea and Frank Coppola drove to what remains of PJP Landfill in Jersey City. Frank took them to an area just outside the landfill limits, under the Pulaski Skyway, and pointed out the location of Hoffa's remains. The spot, which was on land now owned by the New Jersey Department of Transportation and was not part of the Superfund cleanup area in the 1980s, was approximately the size of a Little League baseball diamond. Moldea video recorded the entire outing. Moldea and Frank shared this information with Fox's Eric Sean in an interview that aired as part of Sean's Fox Nation series, Riddle, The Search for James R. Hoffa, which aired in January of 2021. Sadly, Frank passed away on March 16, 2020, before the FBI could arrange for his polygraph test. Before he died, Frank gave Moldea permission to use all of the information he had provided in order to cooperate fully with law enforcement which Moldea was eager to do. Unfortunately, the COVID pandemic hit and put a halt to any plans moving forward. Since the day Hoffa disappeared, there have been dozens of excavations and searches for his body. In September of 1975, investigators spent three days digging up a farm in Waterford Township, Michigan, after receiving a tip from a mafia informant. No evidence on Hoffa's remains were found. In October of 1975, FBI agents searched the trash compactor at the Rally House restaurant, which was mob-owned and only five minutes from the Marcus Red Fox. A tip suggested Hoffa had been taken there after he was murdered, but again, no evidence was found to support this. In July 2003, after an informant claimed Hoffa's body was buried under an above-ground pool at his former home in Hampton Township, Michigan, investigators destroyed the pool and dug beneath it. Nothing was found, and the county had to pay for a new pool for the current residents. In May 2006, the FBI searched the Hidden Dreams Ranch, the farm once owned by Roland McMaster. An informant claimed he saw men burying Hoffa's body there in 1975. The FBI demolished a 100-foot barn in the process of their search and called in geologists, archaeologists, and other experts. After 12 days of searching and not finding anything, they gave up. They did determine, however, that it was plausible that Hoffa's body had been brought to the ranch in order to be transferred onto a gateway transportation truck and then driven to the PJP landfill in New Jersey. 
In 2010, when the New York Giants football stadium was demolished, investigators took the opportunity to investigate an allegation from 1999 that Hoffa had been buried beneath the stadium's foundation. No evidence was located. In the fall of 2012, authorities sampled soil at a home in Roseville, Michigan, after receiving a tip that Hoffa was buried there. No signs of human decomposition were found. In total, the FBI has spent over $100 million and over 46 years trying to track down Hoffa's remains. The FBI's case on Jimmy Hoffa remains open to this day. Solving the case is one of the top priorities for the Department of Justice, and they are willing to investigate any lead in order to finally solve the riddle. With the help of new and improved technologies, the FBI has found new evidence. In 2001, the FBI was able to get a positive DNA match for the hair found in Joey Jackalone's Mercury Marquis in 1975 and the hair taken from Hoffa's hairbrush. Irrefutable DNA proof that Hoffa was inside that vehicle after it had been freshly washed by Chucky O'Brien the morning of Hoffa's disappearance. The FBI requested that local authorities bring charges against the suspects who were still alive at the time, but the local agencies believed the evidence was too circumstantial and no charges were filed. Today, there are only two suspects still alive who might have information about Hoffa's disappearance, Stephen Andretta, who is now 84 years old and lives in New Jersey, and Gabriel Gabe Bugs Bregulio, now in his 80s, who also lives in New Jersey, but neither of them are saying a word. In January of 2021, Dan Moldea and Eric Sean, acting on the information provided by Frank Coppola, brought Fox Nation camera crews and ground-penetrating radar, or GPR, to the spot Coppola pointed out to Moldea in 2019. The GPR data showed evidence of multiple large, round metal objects resembling steel drums buried 8 to 10 feet below the surface. This was consistent with the information Paul Coppola told his son before he died in 2008. As of the writing of this episode, the FBI could be poised to search this location in the coming months. In addition to the PJP landfill site, it is rumored that in the coming months, the FBI will also be searching the parking lot site in Carlstadt, New Jersey, where Moscato Jr. claims Hoffa's body is located, as well as a new location just across the border into Canada that could have involved Tony Palazzolo. The summer of 2021 is shaping up to be a promising time for those who have worked tirelessly to solve the mystery and close the case on Hoffa once and for all. Thanks for joining me on this episode of Murderish. Don't forget to subscribe to or follow my new podcast, Judgy and Juryish. It's available wherever you listen to podcasts. Check out Murderish.com if you want to buy Murderish merch like t-shirts, face masks, and more. If you can't get enough Murderish, subscribe to our Patreon service to get immediate access to bonus content only available to Patreon subscribers. There's a link to go behind the scenes and become a Patreon subscriber at Murderish.com. Thank you to Jamie H. for becoming a Patreon subscriber. I really appreciate you. If you haven't joined the Murderish Facebook discussion group, do it. We have so much fun in there. You can also find me on Twitter at MurderishPod and on Instagram at MurderishPodcast. I've been doing a lot of fun, interactive Q&As on IG stories. So follow me on Instagram at MurderishPodcast if you want to participate. If you'd like to support the show in other ways, tell a friend about Murderish or write a review in your favorite podcast app. Murderish is mixed and mastered by John and Jessica Buchanis of Audio Editing Solutions. Music is by Nico of We Talk of Dreams. This episode was researched and written by Gina Mazzolini. Stick around after the closing music to hear a list of sources used for this episode. As always, Ishers, thank you for joining me on another episode of Murderish. And remember, 
Listening to this podcast doesn't make you a murderer. It just means you're murder-ish. Sources for this episode include a Niche.com article dated 2021 by Bloomfield Charter Township, a Steerforth Press article dated 2016 by Charles Brandt, the Mob Museum article dated July 31, 2020 by Scott M. Bernstein, the Gangster Report dated April 20, 2021 by Scott M. Bernstein. The Gangster Report dated July 30, 2015 by Scott M. Bernstein. Another writing in The Gangster Report dated July 25, 2015 by Scott M. Bernstein. A book titled Hoffa, The Real Story dated 2019 by Oscar Fraley and James R. Hoffa. An FBI internal document dated January 27, 1976 titled Hoffa's Conference Memo. Information found on wikipedia.org, dated April 27, 2021. A book by Dan E. Moldea titled The Hoffa Wars, The Rise and Fall of Jimmy Hoffa, dated 2015. A book titled Confessions of a Guerrilla Writer, Adventures in the Jungles of Crime, Politics, and Journalism, dated 2020, by Dan E. Moldea. An article at the Mob Museum, dated July 8, 2020, by Dan E. Moldea. A Fox.